If you love our crypto content or are looking to learn even more about crypto, be sure to check out and subscribe to our new YouTube channel after this video dedicated to all things crypto. Find new videos every week. Be sure to check the link in the description. Hello, Real Vision viewers. Today, I'm very excited to bring you Zuko Wilcox. Zuko's fingerprints can be seen more or less all across the world of encryption and applied computer science, uh, notably the, the Tahoe LAFS, the decentralized file storage system, the Blake hash functions. But today, he's probably best known to us as the founder of Zcash, the first privacy coin on Web3. So Zuko, welcome to Real Vision. Thank you. Glad to be here. Likewise. Well, an hour feels insufficient, I think, to cover your story, but let's uh, dive straight in. fast. Yeah, I think we better. Uh, the first really is, is uh, what got you initially, in the very early days, uh, involved in encryption in the first place? How did you come to this? The very first thing that happened was I uh, learned how to dial up my home computer to VBSs, which was the thing before the internet for some of us. And you could download files from BBSs and a file that I downloaded contained PGP, the encryption program. And it came with a little text document. I think it was called pgp1.doc or pgp1.txt or something like that. And that little text document was a manifesto from the author that said something to the effect that it's a human right that people should be able to talk privately and we should retain that right even while we move up to having computer networks. And so it was motivating. And then the, I guess the next thing that happened was uh, there was a grand jury convened by someone in the US government to investigate whether that guy was guilty of exporting weapons illegally by writing and uploading that file, or not the text file, but the, the program, PGP. And so he became a cause celeb. Um, and that really motivated me. The combination of his, Phil Zimmerman was his name, his uh, manifesto that privacy and, and private conversations are a natural human right, combined with the government trying to put him in jail for it, that was really motivating. And I was like 17, I think. I'm already saying this, I think this is uh, Phil Zimmerman you're talking about. So he was the uh, the persecuted prophet who, who who got you into encryption in in the very first place. Um, so so on to uh, Zcash. I'd love to do a kind of just a, a quick summary of you know what is Zcash? Uh, why is it different from all the other things that we're looking at, at in 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 Web three? Um, uh -huh. we'll, we'll dive into the into the backstory around it uh, later on. But uh, but can you just in a in a nutshell tell us what it is? Zcash is a cryptocurrency that's open source and decentralized like Bitcoin. The thing that everyone knows about it is not the most important thing in my view, but the most important thing in everyone else's view is that it comes with encryption built in so that you can have private data in a public blockchain. Um, and it's it may be the only one, I think. I'm sorry if I'm overlooking some some others, but at least it was the first and it's the biggest blockchain that has that property. Perfect, and uh, and just from a structural perspective, uh, I think it's well known, obviously, that you're, you're the founder of Zcash, but uh, Zcash uh, comprises the blockchain, but also there is this uh, electric coin company uh, which uh, develops. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you one dollar. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Zcash, but uh, Zcash uh, comprises the blockchain, but also there is this uh, electric coin company uh, which uh, develops, uh, supports um, the security uh, of, of Zcash. Your CEO of that company 
and it's functionally sovereign. So can you explain a little bit uh, uh, how uh, the electric coin company relates to Zcash? Yeah, just like I said that everyone knows something about Zcash and I disagree and they know that the fact that it has encryption built in is the important thing. And I think there are more important things about it that no one knows. Also, everyone knows that I'm the founder of Zcash, but that might not be exactly true. Like there are many founders of Zcash, but I'm like the spokesperson. We uh, we rolled dice to see who would have to take the fall, and it was me. <laughs> well, so okay, that's not exactly how it went down, but so, um, I, what I'm at, the, the truth that I'm actually getting at is that Zcash is a lot more uh, decentralized and resilient uh, than you might think. Um, so that so I can be a spokesperson, I can uh, go on shows and explain stuff. Um, and that's helpful. And I can initiate ideas through my role as CEO of ECC. Um, but if I get hit by a bus, it's not going to slow Zcash down very much at all. Um, and you, so your question was the structure of ECC. Well, okay, so uh, so the, the, the story is some scientists came up with some a method to combine encryption with blockchains. Actually, previous to that story, uh, Satoshi and Hal Finney and others talked about in the early days when when Bitcoin was was it was live, but it was very nascent. It was very young, and they talked about Satoshi and Hal Finney and and almost everyone who had anything to do with Bitcoin for the first eight years really valued privacy. Like privacy was really the, basically the, the animating principle, privacy and um, a monetary policy that's independent of central banks were the two animating principles of Bitcoin. And um, so Satoshi and, and Hal and the others talked about wh whether we could figure out a way to add privacy to Bitcoin. And they even considered using the zero knowledge proof technique. That's the technique that later worked in Zcash. But at the time that they were talking about it, zero knowledge proofs weren't efficient enough in practice. To, it wouldn't, couldn't actually make it work. And then the next step that happened was uh, in about 2013 or so, some sci a big group of scientists from a bunch of different universities, the United States and Israel, and um, figured out a way to combine encryption and blockchain. Um, and, and I wasn't one of them. So that's an example of how I'm not really the sole founder of Zcash at all. They, these scientists came up with this and they published a paper. And um, <laughs> one of the one of the scientists who uh, wrote the paper was named Matt Green. And I had read the paper. I was super excited about it because it was the first time I had seen a, a way to make really strong cryptographic strength pr privacy protection in a blockchain. Um, the other things I'd seen, like mixers and Monero and things like that, I just considered to be not long, uh, long-term solutions um, because they leak information. They're not like cryptographic strength. They're like uh, much weaker than cryptography. So, um, so I was really excited about that paper that they had written, and I, I went to a cryptography conference where Matt Green was giving a talk about his paper. And I was like the first one in line at the microphone to ask questions at the end. And because um, I was so excited. And the, the question I asked was, okay, that's great, but what about that setup process? So there's a thing in the cryptography they'd invented, the zero knowledge proof. So again, Satoshi tried to add zero knowledge proofs to Bitcoin and couldn't because they weren't at all, they're completely impractical back in the day in like 2009 or whenever, 2010, whenever they were talking about that. And then um, these scientists invented a new generation of zero knowledge proofs, which were so optimized that it would be possible to actually embed them into every transaction in a blockchain. And that was that paper. But it came with a catch, which was that to generate that system, you had somebody had to make up some random parameters. And if that person remembered the secret seed for how they did that, they could use that secret seed to cheat. So that was my first question. I was at the mic and I was like, okay, that's great. But what about that secret seed? If uh, you know if somebody keeps it, then they can generate counterfeit coins. And that's not good enough. Like people won't trust that the monetary base is sound if it has that flaw. And he said, 
well, we can like have a computer and we can have a bunch of video cameras pointed at it and we can generate secret seed and then we can just drop it into a fire or something. And I said, that's not good enough. People won't trust that that wasn't a trick. And I think he was irritated because I was like heckling him at his, <laughs> his presentation. He said, fine, you figure it out. <laughs> he called me a few weeks later and said, Ed, you know, I think what happened about that time was Dogecoin was taking off. Dogecoin, what do we call it? He said something in a Twitter or his blog or something like, if people buy Doge, they'll buy anything. Uh, so he called me and he said, you know, we really want, we scientists who invented this concept, we really want it to be a real widely used thing like Bitcoin. And we're starting to realize that this won't happen as a side effect of our grad students' PhD. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, and I had, since he knew about my work with Tahoe LAFS, he thought of me as someone who could actually get implemented and deployed sophisticated cryptography that had never been deployed before. So he said, would you do it? And I said, no. I, 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 I said, well, you know, I've, um, I'm in the middle of working on other stuff. And I thought to myself, privacy is a really good social value. It's a human right, like Phil Zimmerman had said decades earlier and and people need it and they're losing it because of the internet and not because of their choice and not because it's good for society but because the internet allows corporations and governments to take it from them so i thought that's really i would love to help with that but bitcoin has a head start and so bitcoin will be the mainstream thing and anything we could do would just be a niche thing that only a few people would use if they were especially sensitive or motivated and that's not good enough. If it's a niche thing, then it's not really going to change the world. So I said, no. And then I slept on it and I called him back the next day and I said, wait, wait, wait. Yes. Uh, because after I thought about it overnight, I thought, no, wait, privacy is necessary for commerce. You've got to have privacy to send your paychecks and take payments from customers and make investments and make deals and have your savings and everything. So privacy, the thing that protects people's information can be the mainstream thing that can take over from Bitcoin and anything else and be the, the standard thing that everyone on the planet uses. So that's why I decided to go ahead and do it. But was I presume there was also, there was a part of you, you said you had uh, stood up at this conference and asked this question about this, uh, what we call the trusted setup process. Uh, yeah, trusted was, setup, was that, it's called. That was also playing on your mind as a sort of, uh, as a kind of a technical thing beyond which, uh, you might not be able to progress. Because a lot of us were information security specialists, like computer hackers and cryptographers and things like that. We figured we could do a process to generate that secret in a way that nobody would have the opportunity to steal the secret and gain a counterfeiting key. Um, and <laughs> we went all out. and It was called The Ceremony. Uh, am I allowed to mention other podcasts on your podcast? Because there's a great story about the ceremony uh, that was on NPR. Uh, it's called The Ceremony. It was on Radio Lab on NPR. Uh, but uh, but I'll tell you the two-minute version. We went all out and we um, I recruited a few different people and organizations that I thought were super strong about knowing how to keep their computers from being hacked and being tricky. And they were all secret from each other. Nobody knew who each other was. And we told them on the day of the event, you have to go down to a computer store and buy a random computer off the shelf and pay with cash and leave immediately so that no ninjas would have a chance to grab your computer and insert a back door in it before you got it. And then we told them, then you take it to a, a random hotel where you've never been before and you open it up and you rip out all the radios, the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and anything like that. You got to rip that out before you turn it on. And um, at, at our station in Denver, I, I was one of the parties, of the six parties that did this. And we had a, a cameraman. I hired my friend uh, who was good at video to follow me around with a camera and record the whole thing so that there was a, like unbroken timeline showing the whole process. Um, yeah, we had to go find, we wanted to find us 24 seven security cameras that didn't have Wi-Fi. And they don't make those anymore. So we had to buy some used ones from like 10 years ago from the used security camera store and we like set them up in the hotel and um the cryptographic structure of this was we have six different people doing this simultaneously in different corners of the world all under video and other sorts of double checks and they don't know who each other are and 
if any one of them successfully generates their part and then destroys the secret. So at the end, after you've done the process, you have to destroy the computer and make sure that no one can ever retrieve the secret that was in its RAM temporarily, right? So some people just pried the RAM chips out and chopped them to pieces. And we smashed our computer with sledgehammers and um, grind, angle grinders and burned it in a fire and it smelled terrible. We polluted the world. Um, okay, so the cryptographic structure of this is if any one of those six people successfully deleted the secret out of their RAM, then nobody, none of the other five, nor anybody will ever get a copy of that counterfeiting key. That was the best we could do. Um, and I'm pretty sure that was the most like attack resistant process ever. Like I've studied, I've studied computer science and cryptography and information security for decades. And I know about how they set up the root DNS keys uh, for encryption for the digital signatures on DNS on the internet. And that's nothing compared to what we did. <laughs> Our, the ceremony was way better. But you know what? I still don't think it was good enough. What I said to Matt Green when I was heckling him at his first presentation was people won't trust it. And like half of the people find what we did good enough and half of the people still think it could have been a trick or it's not, they don't understand it or whatever. So I think there's still an overhang of distrust even though I think it's the best cryptographic key generation ceremony ever performed. Well, it's certainly, I mean, this is now famous Powers of Tower ceremony is one of the most enigmatic, uh, I think, events in, in the history of, of the web, well, and Web3. That's, so then there was another one. That was the second one. Yeah. The first one had six people. The second one, which was called Powers of Tau, had like almost 100 people. And it involved, and this one was open. So the six people, we could only do six because of computational limitations it took it took too long to do any more uh we actually recruited more than six and we had several of them act as decoys so we told them okay act like you're about to do the ceremony and at the last minute we told them actually you were a decoy so if any spies were following you they they like lost track of the rest of us um but that was only six but then we made it did a second ceremony with the subsequent upgrade of the zcash cryptography so it took uh, a couple of years later we had made another dramatic improvement, which was like an order of magnitude, like 10 times as efficient. Um, and we had to have another ceremony because this new upgrade also um, required trusted setup. And this new ceremony, which is called Powers of Tau, was open to anyone because it was so efficient that we could have any number of players join. And that included all kinds of fun stuff. One guy got some radioactive waste from Chernobyl. And he got into a two-seater airplane and like the pilot flew around in circles while the guy in the back used the radioactive waste to generate random numbers on his laptop to generate his part of that ceremony. So that was pretty great. Um, one guy was in a subway in Tokyo, I think it was. Um, and he rode back and forth in the subway so that there could be you no know, like radio signals leaking out while he generated his. Um, one guy re-implemented the whole thing in a different programming language and then ran his own version to make sure that if there were any bugs in the original implementation, they would not also be in his, and therefore the resulting thing would uh, would be completely safe, even if there was a bug. Um, and there was more and more. There was so much, so many cool stories from the Powers of Tao ceremony. This was when uh, Zcash came onto my radar, when I, I, I read uh, about this ceremony, and uh, you really raised the stakes with this one. It was uh, very impressive. So. So um, we've covered uh, you know, some aspects of the launch. Um, obviously, I, I'm, uh, there was also the the, the now well-known uh, Boulder Summit. I mean, this obviously predated both of these ceremonies, and this was assembling, mm. assembling a, a kind of crack team uh, to to work on on this very cutting edge. You know, we're bringing to, you were bringing together cutting edge uh, consensus mechanisms um, uh, in the, from uh, inherited from Bitcoin, uh, cutting edge zero knowledge proofs. You alluded earlier to the fact that. You know, these things were right on the edge. In fact, actually, I've got a great quote, which I, I want to repeat here. Uh, it's actually a recursive quote. It's a quote of a quote. It's uh, you quoting Sergey Brin. And he said that uh, ZK Snarks are so new that it is crazy that Zcash has succeeded at deploying them uh, in real life application so fast. I agree, you say. Most people don't understand that we compressed the normal timeline by several years. Uh, if you could right. just... Uh, for over a couple of two or three minutes, just explain to us 
what were the things that you were really uh, rubbing up against? What were the major technical barriers to take this kind of theoretical uh, mathematical construction and make it something that people could use to spend money in a reasonable period of time? Um, there was engineering, security risks, and um, usability. So the first version that we launched, it took like, it, it couldn't work on mobile phones um, because mobile phones weren't powerful enough to do the computations. So you had to get your laptop if you wanted to make a shielded payment. And it took like a minute of your laptop warming up and running its fan to make a shielded payment. So that second one that I talked about that was 10 times as efficient, fixed that and made it possible to do it on mobile phones and laptops. And also along the way, we had lots of like, like, like we described these crazy processes to do trusted setup and make it as secure as possible. Um, and trusted setup is not the only way that things can fail, right? Like computer, computers are full of bugs. And in a cryptocurrency, there's nothing else standing between you and losing your money. Like you can't just, if there's a bug and your money gets stolen, you can't just go to someone and, and ask them to, undo it and give it back. So we, we invested really heavily in security all along. Uh, and that really paid off. And actually, this really this is a really good time to, for me to bring up what I think is the most important thing about Zcash. The most important thing about Zcash, and oh, that reminds me, there's a question you asked earlier that I never really answered, which was the setup of the company, the electric coin company. It's a, a company with employees and normal company structure, and I'm the CEO of it. Um, and some some people think this makes Zcash corporate, uh, which I think is kind of funny. Um, but the existence of the company and the employees and all that, and the fact that 20% of the coins generated by Zcash mining go to a set of different organizations for core support functions. That, the fact that the Zcash is self-funding Originally, there was this thing called the Founders Reward, and the majority of the coins were going back to reward the founders who had originally set it up. And then a small fraction of the coins were going to fund the company. To, and the company, and there's also a nonprofit foundation, which is separate and independent. And a few of those coins were going to fund those organizations for ongoing support of Zcash. Um, and then that sunsetted and expired, and the Zcash community decided to create another allocation of the future of the next four years of issuance, uh, which is called the Dev Fund. Um, and that is what I think is Zcash's biggest advantage. And you can see it in uh, an example of why it's so important in the next events that I'm about to tell you, which was the big bug, which was that we discovered some of our cryptographers that were working at the electric coin company discovered that there was a mistake in one of the science papers that we had started with, we were, that we built Zcash based on some science results. Make sense? So there were these science papers that were published before we even invented Zcash. And they were good papers, but there was a mistake in one of them, like a mathematical oversight in one of those papers. And since we had used that math, it turns out that that oversight led to the worst possible outcome that anyone who found the mistake could counterfeit Zcash. So it was like the worst case scenario that we had always feared. And because we had this crack team of cryptographers and engineers, we were able to come up with a plan for how to fix it without letting anyone's money get destroyed or counterfeited, which was that we shipped that new improved cryptography, the one that was 10 times faster. It also didn't have this flaw from that old science paper. And um, that's, Ed Snowden said something about this at the time on Twitter. He said something like, some people wonder why I like Zcash. And this is an example of why, because they have the, the coin, I, I forget how we put it, but he said this is an example, which is that the coin funds 
a full-time support staff and improvement process for itself. Uh, so that if something terrible happens like this, uh, or if there's some great improvement that needs to be added, the coin funds it in se- itself instead of depending on someone else to do it. Does that make sense? Makes sense. So so really what was happening here was uh, these zero knowledge proofs, as you said, so so new as they were at the time, their, their role being to uh, uh, administrate to kind of allow uh, a user on a, on a single player basis to kind of spend some money. And the blockchain's job there is to use these zero knowledge proofs to check that all the logic uh, going on in the spend transaction is correct without anyone in the world knowing it. And what you're saying right. was this kind of bug at the core of, of that mathematics. And it was the job of this uh, crack cryptography team to kind of to jump in and fix it super fast. And and you led this over over a period of, of what time? And when when was it when was it first spotted? And and then how how long did it take uh, the team to patch? I don't remember the precise dates, but it took about ten months, and it was the longest ten months of my life. And if I have any gray hairs, this is why. I'm amazed you said um, that. Because yeah. when we found that out, we were in a tropical island at a cryptography conference. And he called me and said, can you come over? We need to, I need to tell you something. Uh, and I was terrified, like what's going on? Did someone die? Uh, and I, I drove over to the hotel where they were. And he told me that they had figured out that there was this flaw in the science paper we had used years earlier. It started with years earlier. And we, real, and we immediately realized all the implications. We started thinking through like, how could it be exploited and how could it be defended against? You know, we basically came up with a plan right then, but we decided that the only way to protect people would be to deploy the fix as part of our normal planned upgrade schedule. Because Zcash is always, unlike Bitcoin, but like Ethereum, Zcash has always had a continuous evolution paradigm. Uh, whereas Bitcoin has a stability and like predictability above all else paradigm. Um, so we had already had a plan that we were going to upgrade the whole system every so often. And the next upgrade was coming like 10 months later. And it was going to take us quite a few months to build and deploy the improved cryptography, which was both safe against this flaw and was also much more efficient so that you could run it in mobile phones and everything. Uh, so we decided we would go ahead and deploy that and then just deploy it as part of the normal upgrade schedule, because if we accelerated the upgrade schedule after we'd already announced what we were doing, um, it might trigger bad guys to ask why we were changing our plan. And then they might be able to find the flaw before we patched it. Um, and then they might be able to destroy our money. And that was by far the biggest the most money at stake of anything I've ever dealt with in my career, because there was more than a billion dollars worth of Zcash at the time we discovered that. <laughs> and, and so we took the most, again, like with the ceremony, there's two things I've done in my life that were extremely high security, like looking over my shoulder, hiring armed guards, all kinds of stuff. And um, it was the original ceremony with the six people. And then it was fixing this big bug without letting anyone know. So we established a secret inner conspiracy inside the company. So there were only four people who knew that the bug existed, even inside our 30 person company, much less the rest of the world. For 10 months, I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell, talk to anyone, it was horrible. (laughs) And so that was really fun. And uh, I'm really glad that we've done these two things, which are really successful and I'm really proud of them, but I'm ready to get out of the OPSEC business like that can be the only two times i've ever had to do high security stuff in my life well the 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 amount of trust you have to have in that uh that small team and presumably the amount of the kind of the intensity of of talents that you need amongst such a small group of people to fix such a patch i mean they've got to be deep cryptographers they've got to be uh incredibly talented engineers uh and you can't presumably the more people you tell, the higher risk that this gets out. So this must have been... Uh... Yeah, we were we we're seriously concerned um, of either insider attack, like somebody in the company turns evil, uh, which I didn't think was very likely because I never have hired evil people. But um, I was really concerned that... So back in the day, this was a couple of years ago, and it was already true, and it's still true today, that North Korea and Russia and China um, states 
allow or sponsor hackers uh, to steal Bitcoin and cryptocurrency from other people around the world. Um, so we, I was seriously concerned that if, like we didn't talk about the bug uh, through email or through unencrypted messages or anything. Cause I was seriously concerned that if North Korean hackers had compromised one of our phones then they would find out about the bug from us talking about it and they'd be able to counterfeit a billion dollars worth of Zcash. So anyway, it was stressful. And it was a huge relief when it went off successfully. Um, we upgraded Zcash. And then after we'd upgraded Zcash, we contacted a few uh, clones who had copied our code without knowing what they were doing. <laughs> like they didn't have cryptographers. Um, they weren't that well staffed, um, but they had, but we, we wanted to protect their users too, if possible. So we contacted them. We said, we can't explain why, but you really, really need to do this upgrade and you have like 90 days. So go. <laughs> that must be quite painful. You are uh, doing a responsible disclosure with people who have poached your code. That, uh, that must be <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> amazing. Well, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, rescue story. And, uh, and, and I, I hear your point that uh, this, this kind of underpins the, the thesis behind uh, the dev fund uh, to make sure that that crack team is is always there and right. doesn't just kind of set sail and, and let the blockchain uh, run. Right. So that's that's what I said. I think Ed Snowden put it best on that tweet. But that's why other people think Zcash is just Bitcoin with privacy. And some who people who are like investors or long term thinkers or critical thinkers or whatever, they say privacy is just a feature. Like you have feature products and then you have real products. And sometimes when an industry is new, a feature product comes along and it starts to get popular. And if that happens, then one of the real products will t copy that feature, right? And then the feature product will disappear. And so some people think that Zcash is a, not a good long-term investment or whatever because of that argument. And I think that's a great argument. I think privacy is just a feature. Uh, it is widely misunderstood that it's a very, very hard feature to add because you can't add it on top. You have to build it into the foundation. So people who think they're going to start without it and then add it later are in for a shock. But um, nonetheless, it's it's just a feature. And I think it's much more important that Zcash is self-funding and um, continuously improving. Makes absolutely sense. Now, what I'd love to do before kind of launching into uh, Zcash today and Zcash in the future, I know that we we, we need to kind of tie up some uh, some loose ends, particularly in relation to the trusted setup. But before doing that, I'd love to just do a quick flash through uh, some of your thoughts around uh, the history of privacy uh, on the web, uh, because uh, as we know, it I mean, with governments, it can be it can be controversial, and yet actually, you see it everywhere. I mean, privacy traces right the way through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The UK Convention on Human Rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, it's I like the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Right, and uh, it's a pretty good in, amendment in in, in Europe uh, GDPR as well. So uh, you know, governments are presumably going to fall uh, both sides of this line. And uh, can, can you take us back? Because you mentioned this when we had our uh, preparation call the other day. Uh, you mentioned uh, in particular the the early story of first privacy on, on the web, uh, or at least the first um, instance of, of SSL in Netscape. And, and can we kind of cycle back to that? And what was the arc from uh, initially uh, government resistance to government acceptance? And, and how do you think mm. it's going to uh, be replicated, if at all, in, in Web3? Yeah, in, in 1996, Netscape added encryption into their web server and web browser. And in 1996, web servers and web browsers were brand new. Uh, it was really exciting. Mark Andreessen at Netscape was saying that this is going to be huge in the future. Um, it allowed people, normal people, to use the internet for the first time. You know, not people who weren't computer programmers could use it, the internet because of Netscape. And it was also the first time that strong cryptography was deployed to normal people instead of just to the military. Uh, that was the deployment, the first deployment of public key cryptography to widespread masses. Um, the very first deployment was PGP. But it wasn't widely used. It was an important political uh, symbol, and it was used by activists, democracy activists, you know, journalists, and things like that. Uh, PGP was used years later by Ed Snowden and Glenn Greenwald uh, with the Snowden leaks. But it wasn't widely used. But Netscape could become widely used because it was a point and click. It was the beginning of the World Wide Web, and the United States government, which had already considered having Phil Zimmerman tried for uploading PGP, they 
tried to figure out how to prevent this strong cryptography from getting widely deployed. But it wasn't the whole United States government. It was one faction, which was the military intelligence uh, apparatus, i.e. the NSA, um, and the FBI. And they had the support of Al Gore, who was the vice president under Bill Clinton, and a few more members of that of that uh, faction within the government that thought it was important to prevent uh, widespread high strong encryption. And they had all these crazy schemes. They they sabotaged and backdoored things, and they threatened people who exported cryptography because there's no law in the United States. The United States is a a nation of laws. It's um, um, got rule of law. So they couldn't just say, oh, you're not allowed to do that. And there's no law that says you can't do that. But there was a law that said you can't export military supplies without a license to foreign countries. So they declared that um, certain kinds of cryptography were military supplies. And so they couldn't stop you from shipping it to other Americans, but they would stop you from shipping it overseas. And then they came up with this, and that didn't work, right? Because like <laughs> somebody set up shop in Australia and implemented strong encryption into a web server and started selling that. And so the American company like Netscape was now at a competitive disadvantage that they couldn't sell uh, the same thing to Europeans as the Australians could sell to Europeans. And then the, the, the anti-encryption people in the government came up with the craziest scheme ever. They said, okay, We've had the NSA invent this new chip. It's called the Clipper chip. Clipper, C-L-I-P-P-E-R. We're going to have AT&T manufacture them. And then there's going to, the Congress is going to pass a law that any device which is able to connect to this weird new internet thing, it's required to have one of these chips in it. And it's like the Big Brother chip that's going to allow the FBI to spy on every device that connects to the internet. Great, huh? And um, so that was another, like, political or like policy debate in Congress. They were like, I don't know, should we do this? And there was all this um, political activism and like uh, civil disobedience, like writing and distributing cryptography programs and um, protesting against this government overreach and stuff like that. And I participated in that as a, uh, a programmer and an inventor and uh, uh, social activist and things like that. But I think what really won the day is that while that whole debate was going on for dragging on for years, and the, the NSA was trying all these techniques to sabotage or slow down the deployment of this new protective technology, people started using the web for business. People started buying stuff, putting in their credit card numbers and buying like books from Amazon and things like that. And once they did that, it became apparent to Congress that you really needed strong security in the web because all the normal um, citizens of the United States are entrusting their data to it in order to perform normal commerce. Um, and so it, it, it quickly became untenable to plant a government backdoor or to require that that thing be weak and be tappable by hackers. So do you think really that this is this same story is going to be borne out now in Web3? Because obviously, you know, we're able to kind of convey value directly down the line, no institutions. That's what things like uh, uh, Zcash uh, enables. Is, is this where we're going to find there's a turning point? There will be kind of resistance in the early days. And then suddenly, you know, commercial, the commercial impulse will, will yeah. trump uh, uh, everything else. Well, I mean, that's what that's what happened with the web. Um, about. 10 years after the FBI and the NSA started trying to stop the deployment of HTTPS, the, about 10 years later, the United States government started mandating, everyone has to have HTTPS. Uh, if you are dealing with like children or health information, or if you run a US government website, you're required to have HTTPS on it because that protects the users from criminals and from foreign enemies. And I find it a little distressing how like short-sighted people are that they're doing this, they're going through this whole rigmarole again. They're currently um, saying, oh, it's so scary and problematic if uh, cryptocurrencies are out of our control and uh, we can't spy on them and control them in order to you know, have control. And 
there are valid reasons for that, like law enforcement investigations or consumer protection and all these all these valid uh, goals people have. But they're just not thinking through the fact that cryptocurrencies being um, uncontrollable, like uh, that was the word, un, uh, being safe against being uh, manipulated or sabotaged, and Zcash in particular being encrypted so that it's safe against being monitored and surveilled that protects the users from foreign enemies, right? Like it, it's so annoying to me that people aren't thinking through the simple fact that American citizens using blockchains are actively being attacked by foreign enemies. And you can fix that by making the technology stronger. So your view here is that really, um, quite apart from this is not this is not a case uh, that cryptography is now sitting as the gatehouse to some new uh, supranational jurisdiction, but actually this is the mechanism that you need to avoid the capture of your citizens. I think it's both are true, really. Um, in terms of regulation of crypto and open networks of all kinds. National governments do have jurisdictions because that are really important because they control the exchanges and the banks and the companies like PayPal and Square and so forth. And so that's a really important point of being able to exercise their regulatory goals. But they don't and can't control the open networks, right? Like nobody controls TCP IP and nobody controls Bitcoin and nobody controls Zcash. Not, uh, not any company and not any government can do that. And yes, to answer your question, America has, I, I'm kind of a patriotic. You, you, can note, you can notice, like I was eager to add in that the Fourth Amendment is a pretty good one. Like, yeah, the GDPR is okay, but um, I like America. It's got a lot going for it. Um, I like America's values. And I think America has a competitive advantage against other countries and that it benefits from freedom and diversity and free markets and industry and freedom of speech. What we, we can see very clearly, uh, we can learn a lot from the Chinese government's model, uh, which is horrific, right? Um, uh, they're genocidal, they're tyrannical, the government that is. And they have pioneered very successfully using the latest technology to automate and scale and export that. And they have a very clear model for um, their national government controlled digital money, which they're currently, I think, the leaders among nations that deploying digital money. And that very simple model is uh, like, Privacy, like citizens should have privacy from each other and everyone should be subject to the watchful eye of Big Brother. It's very clear. I was very disappointed to see the same model embraced by like the IMF or someone the other day on Twitter. Like I really think the, the democratic Western nations aren't thinking this through. Like maybe they don't understand the technology well enough yet or something, but they're not, they shouldn't try to compete on that with China. They should try to compete with freedom and the values that we have, which are better and stronger and longer lasting than the Chinese model. Super interesting. And uh, I, th I think this actually really leads us now into uh, Zcash's position uh, today and in the future. So I, I'd like to circle back to a, to a couple of things that we, that we touched on. Um, the first was you made a comment earlier. You said there are actually more important things uh, to Zcash uh, than privacy. And can you can you run us through uh, why that is? Like I mentioned, the what I think is the most important thing is that Zcash is self-sustaining, like self-funding, which means it's not going to be undermined or like become uh, weakened by lack of funding, and it's not as vulnerable to cash. I think that's an underappreciated fact that if you if you need something and it's not you don't have funding for it. Now you're vulnerable to someone who can afford to provide that thing by using their influence to redirect 
things to their own benefit. Does that make sense? So um, I think the dev fund that the Zcash community came up with when the founders reward ended is the most important feature or property of Zcash. And relatedly, the fact that Zcash has this tradition and this culture of continuous improvement instead of uh, maximum stability. Those are the two most important things. So we've been able to continuously add improvements, like we doubled the transaction rate. We've added uh, like the, the new cryptography that made it 10 times faster and made it mobile phone capable was uh, a, a huge leap. It was uh, quite ambitious and required a whole lot of expert time and money. Open what, The Zcash community is very likely going to support the addition of um, things like what I call Zcash shielded assets, like the ability to issue arbitrary other tokens representing arbitrary other things on top of the Zcash network, and then gain all the same benefits of the, um, the like cheap, fast, high capacity transactions. I didn't mention the encrypted memos. That's one of the best things about Zcash. Um, every Zcash payment comes with a memo where you can write like what, you know, your customer, your invoice number or whatever. Um, but people can use those memos because they're decentralized end-to-end -end encrypted notes. And so people use them for all kinds of stuff. Like there's a bulletin board where people chat back and forth by sending a tiny micro payment, like one trillionth or whatever of a Zcash along with a note. And that note is what gets posted to the bulletin board. And multiple people have told me that they exchanged love notes through the Zcash blockchain by sending their lover like a trillionth of a Zcash with a love note built in. Like I heard, yeah, I heard several stories about that. One couple even told me that they exchange, they like embedded their vows when they got married into Zcash messages. And there's something really romantic about that to me as a cryptographer, because let me try to explain this. Like Bitcoin, Zcash is a blockchain. So every transaction has to contain a hash of previous blocks and every block has to contain a hash of previous blocks. And if something contains a hash, that means the love notes that those lovers sent to each other Though they got hat, the encrypted version of it got hashed into the blockchain. So now every single transaction in Zcash, in some sense, has to have like the 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 sap of the tree, or I don't know the metaphor, but like their their love notes like included in every transaction. It's built on love notes, but they're private. Nobody's ever seen them except for the lovers. It's great. It's very very nice, uh, very nice use case. And uh, I remember hearing that anecdote on another interview you gave. Um, there are another couple of uh, things I want to uh, cover before we wrap up the interview. And uh, the first is, obviously, we've seen the explosion of, uh, of DeFi protocols, um, especially on Ethereum, but have a lot of the chains as well. Um, where in the long run does, does Zcash uh, stand? Um, I think you mentioned the other day that you sort of see it as a potential capital source, maybe the ultimate capital source um, in the future for um, a lot of these uh, DeFi protocols and other chains. How how does uh, Zcash uh, sit long term economically in the in the uh, Web three uh, ecosystem? Long term, um, I imagine Zcash as becoming the most important digital asset because it's continuously improving, and because this kind of encryption is necessary. Like I like I told. Like, like the reason I called Matt Green back the next day, um, however many years ago, six or seven years ago, is because I realized that that's actually necessary for business to protect you, not from your local court and rule of law, but to protect you from hackers and foreign enemies in a, in a global economy. Um, it's increasingly apparent to everyone that this sort of safety and um, resilience is necessary for our economy. Um, already in the short term, I think Zcash has got a unique use that most people haven't noticed yet. It hasn't, uh, it's, it's a little bit under the radar, which is that today you can, if you wanna participate in DeFi, like uh, 
buy and sell NFTs or lend money or, or borrow money and all this other stuff or trade things on DEXs. Uh, but you want private, like you don't want to be traced. You don't want someone to trace back all of your activity that you did back to you. You can do that today by if you start and end with Zcash as your capital. So there's this whole concept that I think people have backwards, which is that people think that privacy comes from transactions. And I'm starting to think after having worked on this for like 30 years straight, I'm so so people think like oh, I'm start I'm going to start with my Bitcoin or whatever my asset is, my capital, my savings or or hold hodlings or whatever. And now I want to use it and I want to use it privately. So I need a tool or a process to privatize it while I'm using it. And then like if I make money, I'll put my money back into Bitcoin and keep it. And I think that might be the opposite of the paradigm that can work in technologically terms, in terms of protecting you. Um, because if you do it that way, if you start with transparent, traceable capital, then whatever you do, it's probably going to be possible for enemies or someone to deduce the linkage between what you started with and what you ended with, no matter what you did in the middle, basically. I can explain at great length with a whiteboard if you want. Um, but going the other way around, if you start with shielded Zcash in the shielded pool, then you already start with no linkage between your assets and the rest of your life on the blockchain. Okay. And if you can currently do this where you can take Zcash and tokenize it onto Ethereum or Binance Smart Chain. So you get a like an ERC20 token that rep it's redeemable for a Zec coin, right? Now you can use that ZRC20 token. It's worth a lot of money, uh, or ERC20 token, that the Zcash token on, on Ethereum. Um, and you can use those in all apps on Ethereum that support ERC20, right? And suppose you uh, lend it out and you get paid interest, and then you redeem that interest back to Zec, ZEC coins in the Zcash shielded pool on the Zcash blockchain. Now, once again, there's no way for any, because it's encrypted there, there's no way for anyone to trace where it, where it goes after that. It can't, they can't link it to you or to whoever you give it to or anything. So basically, I think it's already the case that you can get the strongest possible privacy and use and all the usability, all the different smart contracts and things you might want to do. Uh, but only if you do it in the opposite way of what everyone thinks. So you don't you don't get privacy from private transactions. You get privacy from starting with and ending with private capital, and that's Zcash is the best private capital. Got it. So th that's very clear. So the thesis here is you start and end with the private capital. the The money does whatever circuits it likes in the meantime, uh, and that's the way around we should think about this. It's almost there's almost a to some extent, a sort of a VPN type uh, sort of mental mental structure around that, or something like that. But uh, hmm. so 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 then uh, finally, and this is something you've you've raised a few times uh, during this this discussion today, um, is around uh, the innovation uh, that uh, Zcash is constantly working on. And I think it's right to say that uh, you've got a big upgrade uh, coming. I think it's going to be towards the end of uh, this year. Um, but I, I'd love to hear more about. Uh, Halo uh, and uh, and how how that's going and what that's going to enable on Zcash once it's implemented. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. So, like I said at the beginning, we thought we could defeat spies, North Korean hackers, whoever was trying to steal, trying to compromise the trusted setup, and I think we did. And we thought we could defeat, you know. Anyone who wanted to compromise the next version with the once we had like nuclear Chernobyl waste flying in planes and underground bunkers and all this great stuff. Uh, but I wasn't sure we could convince other people. Like I said to my friends at the time, or like everyone I was working with at the time, this is great. This is very strong. And it should probably convince most people today. But what about a couple of generations from now? You know, Zcash has worth trillions of dollars, and somebody says, Oh yeah, 60 years ago, some people did the thing and that's why we're safe from 
counterfeiting. I don't know if the next generation should buy that, right? <laughs> so we ought, to do, we ought to be able to do better. And I hope that will also engender greater trust and a wider diversity of like skeptical, suspicious, paranoid people. But again, the science, it wasn't possible. There was no known way to do efficient, scalable, zero knowledge proofs without a trusted setup. Um, the, yeah, so once again, just like Satoshi was blocked because there was no known way to do zero knowledge proofs at all in a blockchain. And we managed to solve that, but at the cost of using this trusted setup. But then there was no known way to do good zero knowledge proofs without a trusted setup. And I always used to tell all the cryptographers I work with, you know, this would be such a great breakthrough. If only someone could discover if it's even possible to do that, that would be so great. And then lo and behold, one of the cryptographers who works on our team, who is also one of the guys who helped find that bug in that old science paper, uh, his name is Sean Bow, And he had just like, the clouds opened and a sunbeam hit his forehead and he was like, oh, and he was working on it for, I think maybe six, nine months. Um, he would tell me, sometimes he'd say, I've been trying to think about how we could have a scalable zero knowledge proof, um, a recursive zero knowledge proof. There's a specific concept called recursion. We don't need to explain what it is, but it means that you can use the zero knowledge proof for anything. Like it means the, the general purpose zero knowledge proof, the last zero knowledge proof anyone will ever need. And he was like, I've been trying and trying to think about how to make a, rec a recursive zero knowledge proof with no trusted setup, but I, I can't quite figure it out. It's probably not possible. It's never going to work. And I said, mm, yeah. Hmm. And then I went to um, his boss, like the other people in my team. And I said, hey, everybody, make sure that Sean has plenty of time to think about this because uh, I literally told him this. I was like, I think there's like a 60% a chance that he's going to come upon like the greatest breakthrough ever if we leave him alone. And that went on for months and months and months and months. And then one day he was like, I know how to do it. And he called us all into this whiteboard and he was like explaining. And, um, and anyway, that was the moment when this thing that we named Halo was discovered. Halo was the first scientific discovery of a recursive zero knowledge proof with no trusted setup. And so um, we proposed to the Zcash community, you know how we do upgrades all the time? How about an upgrade that eliminates this whole trusted setup question so that generations from now when it's worth trillions of dollars, no one will wonder what happened with that ceremony with those six people or those hundred people. And since it's a general purpose zero knowledge proof, that means we can then build anything on top of it in zero knowledge. That includes arbitrary programmability, like instead of, like in Ethereum, you, write, you deploy your program, your smart contract, and then all the Ethereum miners execute it, and then whatever output 51% of them agree on is the output of the program. How about instead, you just post a zero knowledge proof that says, I ran a program, and this is the output, and here's the proof then you don't, the miners don't have to run the programs and there's no possibility that 51% um, of the miners could cheat. So that seems like a breakthrough to me. And um, it also, Halo will also enable things like uh, Zcash shielded assets where you can have arbitrary other tokens running on top of the Zcash network. And I think it might, like the whole field of zero knowledge proofs has been burgeoning for the last three or four years because Zcash worked, like Sergey Brin said, because we deployed Zcash and proved that zero knowledge proofs were actually safe and practical. Um, then a whole bunch of other projects, especially in Ethereum, I think for some reason, um, the Ethereum people have sort of adopted zero knowledge proofs as a valid tool, much more so than other um, uh, developer communities have. Um, but this new one, Halo, seems like it should satisfy, it, it could become like the gold standard. Like it's the only zero knowledge proof you need because it's so efficient. It's recursive, so you can do anything. There's no trusted setup. So you don't have the question about how you do that step and what people are going to think of how you did that step. Um, so I'm super excited about it. And the Zcash community is super excited about it. So they definitely approved. Um, they said, yeah, let's do that. Go ahead. Let's deploy Halo in Zcash. So we're going to do that in probably September or October of this year when it activates. Um, and I really look forward to seeing uh, what other 
purposes Halo gets put to as like understanding of what it does propagates. Well, that's super exciting. So, I, so we can expect out of this the elimination of the trusted setup, and as you said, the, uh, the Venn diagram of people probably who uh, care about privacy and who have distrust of institutions. There's probably quite a lot of overlap there. So, yeah. I guess it's good. Yeah, good I think a lot of a lot of people who. <laughs> Who, who say they're not sure if all of those trusted setups were all like a, a smoke and mirror show that's orchestrated by like the Mossad or whatever. Um, but, but they could be good customers. Yeah, I like people to be skeptical. Um, one more thing about the uses of scalable zero knowledge proofs, uh, recursive zero knowledge proofs, it could potentially solve the blockchain scalability problem, which Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Zcash are all struggling with. And Bitcoin solved it by like, surrendering <laughs> at layer one and said, well, we'll solve it some other way at layer two or with institutions custodying all the Bitcoin or something. Um, and Ethereum has, has been working and working and I really like the way they think they're very, very smart and innovative, um, but it's really difficult and complicated. But if you start with the assumption that you have a trustless general purpose recursive zero knowledge proof system, then you can use that to prove to any portion or, or like shard of the blockchain that the rest of the blockchain has the correct state efficiently, like scalably. So we might be able to use that to make both Ethereum and Zcash and other blockchains might be able to use this to make scalable layer ones that can support like billions of people simultaneously. So that's really exciting too. So all the kind of the legwork, the computational machinery of running a a smart contract is now reduced to this little bit of little bit of information that can, can be quickly checked uh, by Zcash, and so this this opens uh, also uh, programmability at, uh, on on Zcash at some point. Uh, this sounds sounds very exciting. Um, right, and to circle back, it's the fact that the Zcash community allocated this dev fund that allowed Sean Bo to you know think hard about this fundamental scientific problem and come up with a breakthrough that no other scientists have been able to come up with in the last several decades. Um, and it's because of that dev fund that my team and the other teams, by the way, my team is only like a third of the Zcash developer team. Um, there's a bunch of other organizations that are independent and separate from me, which is why if I get hit by a bus or like, kidnapped or something, it's not gonna stop Zcash, it can't. Um, but the dev fund is why all these different teams have the ability to put in this like hardcore world-class engineering to upgrade. It was a 1 billion back when we hit that bug and we successfully protected all the users of our own blockchain and other blockchains from that bug. And now it's like three and a half billion. And, um, but because of the dev fund, we can afford all of the security audits and all the hardcore engineers and everything that we need to do to perform a, a live upgrade, like re replacing the engine of the plane in flight with the three and a half billion dollars at stake. Um, I think we're going to do, we've done it successfully many times, several times before. And I think we're going to do that again with, and make Halo, uh, make us a, a trustless scalable version of Zcash. But again, that scalability, so scalability is an important feature, privacy is an important feature, but all of this is made possible because of the dev fund. That's the most important like meta feature. Well, this is very exciting. We'll uh, we'll all look forward to watching Zcash in 2021, watching that uh, Halo 2 upgrade uh, later in the year. Uh, Zuko, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's thank been you. a wonderful discussion and uh, and uh, thank you for giving us a, your thoughts on, uh, on privacy and Web3. It was an honor, thanks for asking. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.